Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Moy Eng, Interim Program Officer for Arts and Culture at the San Francisco Foundation and previously the Program Director of Performing Arts at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. She was previously a Program Officer with the Joyce Mertz Gilmore Foundation in New York and the Director of Development with the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater and St. Luke's Ensemble and Orchestra. Moy has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Moy, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So you've spent time on both sides of the aisle, as it were. You've spent time on the development side, raising funds for arts organizations. Mm -hmm. You've also spent time, considerable time, shaping funding programs for arts organizations, and influencing the field. Talk a little bit about those two perspectives. It must sometimes feel when you're when you're sitting across from uh, someone to whom you're considering making a grant, like you're looking in the mirror. That's a very interesting image. I'd never thought of it before like quite like that. Since I've spent the last 13 years as a grant maker on this particular side of the desk, I'm really glad that I had 15 years of experience raising money, working in institutions that um, the artistic quality and the product and the service was not a question. but So it was really about how do you best craft a message or bring up um, to a potential donor or a current donor what's, what's best about that company and to really let that shine. And understanding the workings of what are, makes successful companies as well as what makes failure was incredibly important in really providing a foundation to the, job that, the jobs that I've currently had. Well, what makes a, a successful company? Because it mm. starts with the creation, the act of creation. Right. But it certainly doesn't end there. Probably a, a, a really good comparison would be uh, similarly if we looked at San Francisco Ballet, mm -hmm. which really looks at preserving and promoting and really moving forward a traditional Western European ballet form. And then you have Lines Ballet, which is a contemporary ballet company, but in the process, what you have is a choreographer, Alonzo King, who's taken the ballet form and that language and remixed it with contemporary issues, the things he cares about, music, live music in particular, and, and over a period of time has created and built on that ballet language into a language of his own. And that company looks distinctly his. So you asked me, what makes a company successful? Artistry, distinctive voice, leadership, board, staff, artistic director, whether it's artistic director, music director, executive director. And they have to be firing on all cylinders of leadership. It's not good enough to have a great artistic vision. Absolutely. And it's, it's not only in the operations side, it's also on the governance side. You want a board that understands its role as a policy-making institution, as an institution that can speak externally and face externally, not only building an institution, but face externally and lending their name. And then you have the capacity piece of it. Does the institution or the organization, no matter what its size, have the appropriate human and financial resources to really move the artistic vision in a way that's exciting and compelling and appropriate. And last but not least, a sense of curiosity. I know creativity is talked about a lot, but curiosity and a willing to be open to change and to be looking for that. So in a sense what you're saying is, is the institution in dialogue with its environment? And you see that as, as that sort of vigorous dialogue and the ability to respond to the, mm -hmm. to the environment as being a, a factor in engaging the strength of the organization. Correct, and I think the response is really calibrated depending on the individuals, the nature of the change. I mean, how you respond to the economy five years ago, pre the great almost depression, is very different than what unfolded in October of 2008. So I think that you have to sort of calibrate and really listen closely. Sometimes there's no response needed, but you carry on because the components of leadership and governance and the artistry, those, the major things are really in place. And it's not status quo, but you don't need major calibration. Right. So it's really staying in touch with all this. The question is then time. When do you do that? How often do you do that? 
And so um, there's a level of fluidity involved in that. Conversely, when do you know that organizations that might have, uh, have a long history are, are, or, or, or even a short history but have been strong are, are beginning to lose their way? How does the person on the other side of the table, the foundation side, think about a time when maybe the answer needs to be no? No. It's never easy to say no, and there's always more no's than there are yeses on a for a grant maker. I don't care what the institution is, with all the worthy institutions. But when an organization uh, starts to falter, things like mission drift, like when you, when an organization's leaders begin to take on projects or programs or expand or contract the institution in a way that gets away from the original intent and vision and core programs that really keep, some, keep a mission alive, so mission drift. Um, weak and or inappropriate leadership. Sometimes you have well-intended leadership, but not the right skill set for the job at hand. You start losing audience or participants. And in the case of, for instance, a music school or a community school, you start losing partners, you start losing funders, and it may not even take a major crisis. It may happen and the erosion over a period of years. Perhaps the excitement of the, uh, of, of the, of the creative people, whether they're creative people in the administrative area or in the artistic area, that excitement no longer exists and they start to, to devolve. And it's, I assume that there are certain circumstances where in order to increase capacity or to create a change, there are grants that are made in order to, to facilitate sort of the, the transformation if there's the will to do that. There is, and I think that the question really becomes is do you, does, does a funder or a donor come in, individual donor come in with capacity building assistance or technical assistance at a time for an institution they care deeply about where things have devolved so much that this is sort of a last chance Right. But we recognized when it was a we that things happen over a course of time. Institutions and organizations and artists struggle, and there are some moments that the struggle is much greater. So if you have a sense of, and the you was the institution or the mm -hmm. set of leaders, if you understood what the problem was at hand and had some sense of a, that you wanted to deal with it and make it better, if not resolve it, that to me from a grant-making standpoint, if the artistry was good and the leadership was good and there was good intent and a real will to, to make the problem go away or be resolved, that um, if there were, mon there, was, if there were funds, we'd want to support an effort like that, as opposed to when the problem has gone so far along, sometimes, um, oftentimes, no amount of money can be helpful at that point. Could you talk a little bit about um, the role of foundations in defining the field of play? I would say that, that that's very complimentary, Mark, especially what's embedded in that question is foundations have an enormous amount of influence. And while they do have influence, I think that given the amount of money and their commitment to a field, that affects the level of influence, certainly, and the amount of play, as you put it. However, um, I think that foundations can play very specific roles if they stay focused on a particular either mission or a particular goal at hand over a period of time. In order for a foundation to be maximally effective, right. what are the um, attributes of a program mm. um, that will allow them to have uh, impact in the field? I could very easily talk a great deal about theories of change, logic models. But what I'll do is take the values from that, um, because I think that, um, at the, at, that for anybody who wants to give money, whether you're institution or individual, I think these elements are really important. Um, why? Understanding the rationale of why a particular issue or an artist is important. So understand what's the rationale. Secondly, What's the outcome? What do you hope the world, how do you hope the world to be better as a result of supporting some set of activities um, that deal with fostering either artistry or arts engagement, whatever that is, how do you want the world to be better? So that there's some goal that 
that I would want to work towards. So I'll just put myself in that so place. Creating new mm -hmm. art, or you're presenting Whatever existing it is. art, mm -hmm. or you're you're bringing people into contact. But that but that focus on, right. on purpose. having some and sense of purpose or mission or goal, and engagement. If it's important to, for some people, it may be really important that every child has an opportunity to engage in art, whether it's music or theater or dance. Then what happens is in between those two points, figuring out and being intentional about what kind of activities or strategies do I want to support as a donor right. that will help me get to that place where either a child is better or the world is better, whatever that goal is. And so that's what I would say having some sense of what's what do I think is really important? What's my rationale? Why do I want to do that? And what would I like the world to be like so as a result of these investments? In a sense, it's the inflection of the value case that is being presented by the development professional or the member of the, uh, of the staff or board that is advocating. You're also being very specific. This is what we intend. This, mm -hmm. is, this is why we intend to mm -hmm. do it. This is how Agreed. we intend to do it. It's not only the value case, though, that's very beautifully said. It's also how the values manifest itself in the programs. And then, what's the potential impact? Are they actually being successful? In terms of, of how you look at organizations, either as a development professional right. or as a grant maker, mm -hmm. you've talked a little bit about those four different elements as a, as a grant maker. Talk a little bit about the person that is not in that, which is me, the person who's actually going to view the performance and experience the art. Right. How, do, how, does, how do both sides triangulate with the, the viewer in a way that, that informs their case on either side? In the 13 plus years I've been a grant maker, and prior to that, consulting with foundations and uh, state arts agencies, I would say that that the historical take has really been at a wholesale level. Really talking to the organizations or the grantee organizations and taking a hard look at are they indeed reaching their audiences or their targeted participants. Okay. So that's the first piece of it. From a fundraising side, you're a, a lot, one, one would expect a lot closer, though not sectorally. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if you stay on top of a particular discipline or a particular area within not-for-profit arts because of the organization that you sit in and you work in and you live and eat and breathe. So living at, at Alvin Ailey, one of the things that was really important to understanding for me and being a bridge in understanding what does the work look like, how is it being received, what was going down in the studio as often as I could, not only during rehearsal and the creation of a work, but during performances at City Center and throughout the country when the company was on, U on its U.S. tours. The second piece that was equally important was what happens when a young person goes to school, right. into the dance school, whether they ever become professional as well as those that are really fast forwarding right into Alvin's company. What's the, what does the curriculum look like? What's the impact of that curriculum on young people? What happens to young people once they join the company or don't join the company? What's the imprint of dance? Um, you talk about the artist mm -hmm. and the person experiencing the art as if they are also inflections of each other. So on the one hand, you have the, the artist and the, and the person experiencing the art mm -hmm. as mirror images of, of one to another. And on the other hand, you have the grant maker, the funder, mm -hmm. and all these different partnerships are evolving this very complex pattern. It's a conversation. It involves a level of listening and watching and experiencing and then taking those experiences and using them within whatever the context or role that I play, whether it's a grant maker, a consultant, the fundraiser at a senior staff level in a company. It doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, for me, one of the things that makes me very good at my job, or I try to, is listening closely to who we intend to serve, as well as who makes the work. One of the things that, that I find truly fascinating about how you approach this is, is this, this particular area is integrated into your life and into mm -hmm. your sensibility. And so you 
are not just a grant maker, you're also a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. You're not just an audience member, you're also an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, t talk a little bit about that. I'm very flattered you would bring that up. I've realized in retrospect at key points in my life that I look at at the decade, every time I reach a decade birthday, that what's core in my life, really most essential, is my family, my music, and my work. When I was growing up, I had some seminal experiences that turned me on to the power of art. So I learned very early on that I had a voice and that I could sing. And uh, for a child who grew up traditionally Chinese, where my voice was really part of a group and my value was really part of um, having children and uh, hoping to parent in them values of being a good Chinese uh, citizen and, a, and to carry on the Chinese culture in that way. And part of that was that you don't ask questions and you don't, in fact, you don't question anything. And for me, art was particularly powerful because it was a, a form not only for a shaping of personal identity and creative expression, but as possibly a way to change the world. And so you recording and you perform every so often, and, mm -hmm. and that has been a, a, a consistent uh, part of, of, particularly in the last years of, of, of your work. It's in the last decade, and it, um, it's because I stopped singing for a long period of time. And an old friend of mine from grad school called me up to tell me that he had won a Grammy and was up for an Oscar, but that wasn't the real reason why he called. <laughs> he said, hey, you want to play jazz again? And um, it reminded me in a very personal way, other than I just like my friend a lot and love his playing, that um, that went away in a way that I never intended it to. So it's back, and it may not be fair, but it's real. But for some, for, for some people, if you have an artist's life, or say that you have an, a, a thriving practice in art, whatever that is, that makes you less serious as a professional, and vice versa. My musician colleagues know that I have this daytime life, and many who do not, and only know me as a, as a jazz singer, um, I'm less serious as a, as a musician. So I think that it's a juggle to deal with peop the people's perspectives. But from my vantage point, they feed into each other. And they've um, having both in my life has enriched my life immeasurably. And some people even think I sing really great. And other <laughs> it's all good. And, and as far as the, the grant making and the management piece of my life, what I got as an opportunity that I feel thrilled and honored is I get an opportunity to, with an institution, possibly just touch pieces of a sector and make a lot of artists' lives better and a lot of people's lives better. And that's, um, that's very rare. So I feel like I've got the best of certainly two worlds. Could you talk a little bit about the difference between working for a community foundation like the San Francisco Foundation mm -hmm. and a family foundation? My understanding, if we were doing a contrast and compare, is with a community foundation, it really is very much through the lens of being place-based. Right. Uh, really focused, I know this sounds like an oxymoron, on a breadth of concerns that affect a particular community, however it defines that community, geographically, demographically. And thirdly, um, because its endowment right. comes from numerous people, that it really acts in effect as a community bank, where a private foundation and a family foundation, what's really guiding that the lens depends on the family and their, their intent and their vision mm -hmm. and what they care about. And while they may be in their third or their fourth or their fifth generation of family, that original vision as how, you know, looking back uh, becomes really important. And how do you honor that vision right. of the original founders? For instance, with the Hewlett family, with, with Bill and Flora Hewlett, classical music and opera were incredibly important to them. And, and from my, from my 
limited experience, it was a gift that they gave to their family, their children, and, and to their grandchildren. So let's talk about the, the, the difference between uh, being a, a program officer and being an interim uh, person mm -hmm. who, is, who is running a program. Uh, wh what are the different roles that you see? And, uh, and coming into the San Francisco Foundation, what, what will your role be over the next six months? At the San Francisco Foundation, the program officers direct the programs. I was asked because John, at the point, was leaving in mid-April, late April, um, and had 30 days to six weeks notice. And there was some concern with, one, how do you move forward and continue some stability in a program? Right. And two, perhaps even more importantly, because the San Francisco Foundation is undergoing a foundation-wide strategic planning process that's going to really affect all of its programs, its grant making, the institution itself. What kind of person do we bring in with what the skill set to not only manage the program and its current activities, but also brings um, a level in his or her skill set and experiences to help redesign the program. So at, it, it's unclear what kind of program officer or director for arts and culture will be needed in terms of the skill set right. at the end of this. Right. And so that's why it made, it made sense for me to be an interim. It's very interesting. Is, is, this, a, is this a dialogue that um, extends into the board, or is it um, being led by the chief executive of that, uh, of that organization, or is there a management team that is leading that? The strategic, that strategic planning process is, I understand it, again, because I'm being dropped into it sort of midway right. through the movie, that it's staff-led, but everybody's involved. And in de not only within the institution, but um, as well as folks like donors, fellow f funders, um, people who have been grantees and organizations that have been grantees. So it's been a very inclusive process over this period of time, as I understand it. How are we to see uh, the, the state of the arts today? I think it's the most exciting time for arts and culture, period. And it's exciting because it's mushy and it's chaotic and it's inspiring because of the emergent and current technologies which allow anybody to make art and to talk about making art, to talk about their doing almost immediately 24-7. That's incredibly powerful. Um, we're crossing time zones, we're crossing geographic zones. You know, ha sharing something with my friend in, in The Hague is not a, any big deal anymore. It's not like sticking a, a videotape in the snail mail and getting it right. there 10 years ago, which was part of the emergent technologies then. You thought that was great, then they didn't have to be at a live performance. So it's a really exciting time. And part of that is whenever anything, a set of things that are new comes into play, other things go into stress. Maybe part of what we're seeing is the fact that free uh, results in the diminution of resources to continue to support. What I've been unfolding is while well, free is supposed to be the new, the new economic model or the newish economic model, the problem with free, or one problem I find with free, is that having music, having culture free, when you have ideas free, um, do we value ideas? Do we value knowledge, not just information? Um, what do we value anymore if we presume everything should be free? And how do creators keep going? For an artist who has chosen his or her life to make work or to, to continue a particular art form with and, and present that work, you're hoping you're going to pay your rent or your mortgage. So if free is the new economic model, where do we go from, how do we sort of resolve that somewhere in the middle? And we're watching this unfold. One critical focus has been really around engagement. How do we continue, what's the role that Hewlett could play in making arts and culture part of every person's life on an ongoing way that's accessible and affordable and our experience of relevance. So that's sort of the question that Hewlett was looking at or I was looking at with my team when I was at Hewlett. Moy Eng, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and for sharing your insights. We do indeed live in these interesting times for the arts. And thank you again. Thank you, Mark.